uh, look forward to reading. Happy St. Patrick's Day. You're all wearing your green, which doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Wouldn't know it was a holiday. But, um, we'll move first to the minutes of the uh, January 20th, uh, 2021 board meeting, and those will need approval. Uh, you got a copy of them uh, in your board packet. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes or any changes or corrections? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, well, we'll move right along to the reports, and Dr. Van Galen will start us off and give an overview. Thank you, Governor Hershaway. Uh, to begin with, I want to certainly welcome and acknowledge Corey Reed, who is here today, and express my gratitude for her willingness to serve as our interim director of a of athletics. Uh, Corey, as many of us know, is an outstanding professional that is really committed to the success of line athletics. So welcome, Corey. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge the announcement by Dr. Paula Carson that she is stepping down as provost, returning to the faculty at the end of June. I look forward to providing some additional comments on the progress that she has led at our June board meeting. In my written report to the board, I describe how two of our outstanding faculty <laughs> Becky Harshaw from our dental hygiene department and Dr. Bill Fisher from history have impacted our community through their efforts. The community oral health programs and history day are great examples of how our campus connects with the Joplin area. Another example of outstanding work that I want to acknowledge today is the extraordinary efforts of our facility staff and others who were on the front line in battling the ice, snow and cold in February which I've been assured is unusual in Joplin. <laughs> we really appreciate their hard work. And uh, I don't believe they knew I was going to say that, but many of them are in the back of the room today. So thank you again. <laughs> the remainder of my comments will be focusing on the collaborative effort between the university, the Joplin Area Chamber of Commerce, the city of Joplin, and the leadership of Joplin Area School Districts to develop a vision for an innovative re reuse of the former downtown Joplin Public Library building connected to the Connor Hotel history. So there are a lot of <laughs> dots connecting today. Uh, this concept has been branded as the Launchpad Project. On February 8th, I joined Toby Teeter from the Chamber and Dr. Melinda Moss, Superintendent of Joplin Schools, in presenting this idea to the Joplin City Council. I provided the board with hard copies of some of the presentation slides from that evening, uh, and they've been distributed. As part of this plan, the university would establish a Missouri Southern Downtown Center within the facility. The university's presence would include reception and welcome space that would serve as a new front door for Missouri Southern. The center will provide information and access to university programs for prospective students and the community. Launchpad would also house the Small Business Development Center, currently located in Plaster Hall on our main campus. This would serve to increase the visibility and accessibility of the SBDC, which is really a critical driver for our region's economy. The facility would also be utilized as Missouri Southern Downtown Internship Hub to increase the number and the quality of internship opportunities for our students, especially with downtown job and businesses and nonprofits. MSSU students are already interning with entities such as Midwestern Interactive, Liberty Utilities, and the Downtown Joplin Alliance. Nationally, and I think this is an interesting statistic, for college students having an internship experience, 68% are offered a full-time position by that business or organization. Finally, Launchpad would be home for a new program entitled CAPS, the Center for Advanced Professional Studies, in which high school juniors and seniors would devote half of their school day to CAPS courses. These high school students would work on projects at Joplin area business, industry, and nonprofit locations. Participating high school students from Joplin, Web City, and Carl Junction to begin with would solve real world problems and be mentored by Joplin area employers. The university would facilitate the program 
and provide dual credit opportunities as appropriate. Finally, I'd like to share with the board several images developed by CGA Architects showing some concepts for the university's physical presence as part of the project. Uh, these are also in your um, packet of materials, but this is a floor plan for the facility. Uh, and you can see on the lower left region, the yellow and uh, orange region, which represents three culinary venues that are part of the plan. The university actually would occupy only about 10 to 15 percent of the facility. And that space is shown in the upper right of this diagram in light green. So on the next slide, I'd like to zoom in on this area of the plan to show you a bit more detail about what the university envisions in that space. As shown here, the university would utilize office space, perhaps five offices, to host the SBDC and CAPS program, and a conference room and a reception and entry area, as shown here. The next slide is a rendering of the reception space, essentially a new front door for Missouri Southern downtown. And this slide is of the entry area designed to be very professional and welcoming. So this would be the Missouri Southern kind of welcome area within the Launchpad project. Launchpad is designed to enable collaboration and synergy to support entrepreneurship, economic development, and innovation. In that spirit, the university is also excited about the opportunity to utilize the many flexible and shared use spaces that are envisioned. For example, for a downtown internship fair to connect students and employers, or to host a Saturday workshop sponsored by our Women in Science Club, or have some of our faculty provide a lunchtime or after-hour seminar on topics of community interest, from art to science, from engineering to business. The vision for the university's role in this innovative project supports Missouri Southern's commitment to strengthen and build new connections in Joplin and our region. Simply stated, as a public university, it is critical for us to be a leader <coughs> in the development of talent, culture, community, and the economy of Joplin and the region. This project would provide new opportunities to do just that. So I did want to provide the board with an overview of the vision for Launchpad that was presented to the City Council. Uh, it's something that um, I think we can be very excited about. Uh, it's a longer process that's going on, uh, but I'm very happy to answer any questions on this project or anything else. It is exciting. Great pictures. Are there any questions for Dr. Van Galen about uh, the Launchpad or anything else in his report so far? Yeah. So has, has, there been a, has there been any discussion about the, the anticipated cost for renovating the facility to, to meet these objectives? The estimated cost would be $10 million to renovate this uh, facility uh, to really bring it up to what's envisioned in the plan. Yes. And that is that anticipated to be a, a public funding? Private funding, combination? Uh, certainly a big piece of it is envisioned uh, it to be public funding through the city. And so this presentation was to the city council. I know uh, Nick Edwards is continuing to talk to the council about uh, some avenues to provide some potential public funding for the facility. Uh, so the university would not own the facility nor its foundation. Uh, ultimately, the university would be a tenant, if you will, mm -hmm. in the larger facility. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I just noted myself, there's even more pictures than you provided on the, in the packet we got, yes. that <coughs> more views of the things planned. So it is kind of an overall city project. But it is. Definitely good for MSSU. Dr. Van Gillen, what's the time frame for all of this? I know. Um, uh, Conversion-wise, what does that look like? Well, the next step is for the city to determine what's the best route for its participation. Uh, there would uh, quite possibly need to be a vote of the people to provide some funding for this project. So the way the timeline lays out, it will probably be at least 18 months before this could become a reality. Thank you. 
else of Dr. Van Galen now? Does that conclude your report? It does. No? Okay. We will move then to our executive vice president, Dr. Hudson. Thank you again for the book. Oh, you're and, uh, quite welcome. Uh, two items I want to pull out of my report. Uh, first being uh, fundraising totals for the fiscal year so far. Uh, about halfway through the, or more through the third quarter, we are at $3.4 in fundraising income towards a $5 million goal. That is up $1.37 million from this time last year. Uh, so very good fundraising numbers uh, from the staff in the Office of Development. And then I also want to draw your attention, it begins on the bottom of page five and continues on page six, uh, the Hanover study. Uh, we're in a very competitive market for recruiting new freshmen and transfers, and so it's always a good opportunity to get a third party's assessment of where you could improve and, and be more effective in that regard. Uh, so we contracted with Hanover Research, which is a national higher education research firm, to take a look at why students did and did not choose Missouri Southern. Uh, from the last three recruiting cycles. So we reached out to students who were part of the last three recruiting cycles. They were all admitted, but some enrolled and some did not. Some chose to go to other institutions. And so there were really three primary reasons. One was a more competitive financial aid package. Uh, that had already has already been addressed where we expanded MOSO Merit, our automatic institutional aid, uh, to be higher amounts and more options within those amounts. Um, and so that's already been taken care of. And then the other two were regarding our communication, where we would highlight more program-specific information and expand our social media outreach. And we have uh, uh, Kayla Monteleone in the admissions office as our communications coordinator, and she's working on both of those as we speak. And so we do um, appreciate the feedback from Hanover and, and um, trust they will make big gains for us in our incoming freshman and transfer classes. In that regard, I will tell you that date to date, so one year ago today, uh, we are currently up 11% in new freshman admits. So those are students that have applied, met the criteria, they have their complete packet in place, they've been admitted. Now the challenge is to get them enrolled, and we are up 1%, which is basically flat, in new transfer students for the same time period, year to year. Well, that doesn't mean we're done. Uh, we still have room to go for our goal of 900 new freshmen and 400 new transfer students on the 20th day of classes in September. Uh, but if you do a day-to-day -day comparison, we, we feel like the MOSO merit, the, the added outreach, and all the work our admissions office is doing will keep us plugging away towards those goals in September. Could you remind me again, Dr. Hudson, uh, what the conversion rate from admit? usually is and what you project for this year? Right. So it's usually about a third uh, okay. will, of those who are admitted will end up enrolling. And that's why we need about 2,600 admits to right. get to the 900. Right. Uh, and so that's our goal for admits is around 2,600 students. And that's what we're working toward. We're, uh, and I'd look to Dr. Wingert, uh, existing students are enrolling now or sometime in the near future. And so after all the existing students are in, then we'll begin to look for that enrolled status amongst these new students. Have they converted from being admitted to actually registering for classes? And then the next benchmark after that is, do they stay through the 20th day in September? And you have a couple of new tools in your toolbox, so with the new scholarship program. New scholarship program, new customer so. relations software that's a couple of years old that really does a great job with communication to prospective students. Uh, a lot of collaboration on campus between faculty and staff, and, and so we're doing everything we can to hit those marks. Are there any uh, questions for Dr. Hudson, Doug Governor Haley? One additional question. Your process. So that's total students, so it could be a student from Connecticut would count in that if they stay through the 20th day, but we do recognize that the majority of our uh, students come from a 100-mile radius of Joplin, and so we have a on-the-ground recruiter that works full-time in Springfield, the same thing in Neosho, the same thing in Tulsa. Uh, those folks used to be based here at Missouri Southern, would travel out. We have placed them in those markets. They're working there full-time. Uh, same thing in Kansas City and St. Louis. And so we have recruiters that work the local area, but we're really hitting those metropolitan areas hard 
uh, because we do believe we're, we're competitive not only on the quality of our programs, but on our price point as well. Anything else for Dr. Hudson? Well, I thank you for that work and because we all recognize due to education from you that it's the key for our success here that meeting those uh, retention and recruiting goals to meet our financial goals and everything else. So if there's no other questions for Dr. Hudson, we will move to our provost and vice president for academic affairs, uh, Dr. Carson. Thank you so much. Uh, in your in the copy of your report, I just want to highlight a few things. These items are items that uh, begin to provide some sense that we are returning to some normal or new normal in some ways. Um, and I'm very excited about that. This was obviously a very busy time of year for us to assess and to celebrate in a variety of different different ways and so that we can maybe resume uh, while still respecting and maintaining mitigation strategies is, is really nice for us. And one of those things is the Earth Day, Missouri Southern is actually the regional Earth Day host and so they're not very many programs around. Uh, we engage and participate with a lot of community organizations and educational institutions and um, we are going to host that this year. We will have the traditional reduce, reuse, recycle art poster and product competition for middle and high schoolers. We are also adding a campus trash pickup on April 22nd. At this time, it can only um, engage our internal stakeholders. So you guys are invited and encouraged to participate if you want to. Um, but basically the winter has been very harsh for our prairie and for our cross country course and for our beehives. We sadly lost all of our bees um, this year. And uh, during that time there was a, a lot of frozen, a lot of trees came down and signs came down and a, a lot of the educational things that, that we use. There was also just an enormous amount of trash and debris that was blown into those areas. And so I'm very thankful that um, the biology department has uh, supported the idea for Earth Day for us doing cleanup on that side, largely on that side, but also um, on the riparian side of um, Turkey Creek. So very excited about that. I do want to thank Physical Plant, which has been acknowledged here earlier, but when they were, um, you know, preparing for the cross-country course to host national competition a couple years, and when it was just very unsafe, there were trees everywhere, down splintered everywhere. The the infamous shoot tree um, sadly was badly damaged, and a physical plant was out there helping clean that up. But there's still a lot to be done, and um, very excited that we're going to focus on that side. We're also ordering new bees, so we'll repopulate our hives, so we'll have the honey. I uh, wanted to give you a dual credit update uh, there. Uh, National Student Clearing House had some seminars this week, talked about the impact of COVID and the demography on enrollment. Uh, we, we know that there's declines pretty much universally, uh, nationally specifically. And dual credit has also gone down really significantly for many institutions, which is an important pipeline and has caused great concern. But I'm very excited that we're actually up in dual credit. Um, we continue to market that out of academic affairs really, really hard. We are, um, we market to schools all over Missouri and we are very happy to um, have partnered with five, <clears throat> five new schools this year, several new faculty. I wanted to let you know an initiative we introduced here before on the MOVE initiative whereby those who are eligible for free and reduced lunch in high school are eligible to take up to six credit hours for no tuition, which is a reduction from our normal $50 per hour. We have 182 students taking advantage of that, and that's really significant. Um, you know, we were going to be blown away to be able to host 25 or 30 of those students, and we have almost a couple hundred students that otherwise would have really no access to education um, that we're able to help. We are also introducing another new initiative in concurrent enrollment department uh, this summer. It is called Get Ahead Together. We are going to start with an uh, incoming sophomore cohort um, of 25 students. There will be 
selected very, very carefully to make sure that they're up to the academic rigor, that we have good predictive um, confidence in their ability to su succeed. They will travel through each of the summers as a cohort, the next three summers as a cohort. Um, we will have specific synergistic courses mixed together, one in June, one in July, and one that runs both June and July. The faculty will work together on those courses. At the end of the three summers when they graduate from high school, they'll essentially have a year. They, they won't have the whole associate degree, but a year of credit under their belt. And um, we're working closely with the high schools to make sure that those courses will be counted for their high school curriculum as well as for their college curriculum. So um, we're pretty close. We're starting that this summer. We're pretty close to finalizing that. We have the courses selected. We've been meeting with the high school counselors and um, getting ready to op open applications for that program. The Run with the Pride is another event that was canceled last year. Kinesiology department and their students have capstone projects that that involve a lot of event development and event management. They have events all year long, including um, Lifetime Sports Academy and um, a variety of different 5Ks. Everything has largely been canceled for them for the past year. So we were able to get um, President's Council support, respecting the, um, the 50 maximum at this time gathering for only internal staff, faculty, and students, but we're gonna uh, be able to offer the run with the Pride 5K. Um, again, it would be great if we could have family members and community um, members participate in this race. Right now, it's just not part of our COVID contingency plan, but I wanted to let you know about that. It is um, really caps on experience for kinesiology students, but it's also a fundraiser for a scholarship and, um, we also invite you guys, if you want to participate in this race, because we're looking for runners. <laughs> but it's only limited to um, faculty, staff, and students. So um, we wanted to let you know about that as well. It's a, a great event and really beneficiary, ben beneficial to many. The last page of your report is just our fire program. We had actually scheduled a press conference with the city of Joplin to release information about our fire program, but it was during the snowy weeks <coughs> and um, we canceled and we're having some trouble rescheduling because essentially, as was stated earlier, we're starting registration for um, the summer and fall very, very soon. So we are introducing our brand new fire program this summer. It is in close collaboration and joint development with Joplin Fire Department. We will use some of the facilities out there at their um, public safety training center by the airport. We have worked with the Joplin Fire Department and other fire departments to vet really <coughs> qualified faculty members. And um, all of the data and information tell us that fire paramedic Individuals trained in fire and paramedic are the most desired for that particular occupation and the growing need, particularly for rural areas that that we serve. And um, so we were going to start this last summer, and then we were not able to because of COVID. And um, we just continue to persist and try to improve it and, and work with the Joplin Fire Department. And so we are really, really excited to actually get students enrolled in that program this summer. They've already started to interview for that program. I think it'll be a really fantastic partnership and a fantastic service to the, particularly the rural communities of Missouri who really need individuals trained in both of these disciplines. And that's all my report. Listening to your report, it really <laughs> made me think back of what this year has contained. And so I thank you again mm -hmm. for all your work uh, this past year and to all the faculty and staff. Uh, it just brought back how much we have pivoted and how much is going on this year that wasn't expected. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for Dr. Carson about her report? We, we hope between 11 and 15, we have capacity for up to 25, but we're hoping for opening enrollment of 11 to 15. Are there any other questions? And that will be for the fall enrollment. We're starting in summer because the they way can that enroll <laughs> for the summer. Okay. Yeah. The, the way the fire training is, it can't be too cold, can't be too hot. Right. Um, 
there's just a lot of parameters on when to optimally train. And so our team working with the city has decided we're going to do the fire portion in the summer. But the word just ha didn't get out the way we had hoped because of the weather. But it, because of the press conference. But it will be yeah, so we're kinda gonna able start, to enroll by summer. Yeah, just doing it on our own. And hopefully at some point um, we might still be able to have an announcement or the first class or something with the city. They're very interested in doing that, as are we. Um, but it, it just didn't... It just didn't work out with the snow. An 11 to 15 with the 25 capacities, probably mm -hmm. a good goal. Are there any other questions for Dr. Carson about her report? Okay, moving right along then to our interim vice president for student affairs, Dr. Winger. Governor Hershaway. As mentioned previously in our budget meeting this morning, uh, Treasurer Linda Ice mentioned that our students will soon be receiving their portion of the HERF II student grant funds. For those of you who are unaware, HERF stands for Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds. So we're excited to announce that everyone has worked really hard to make sure that those funds get distributed to students this week, just before spring break. So again, that's about $2.4 million being dispersed directly to students in the coming week. Uh, even with the global pandemic going on, we were still able to deliver, Career Services was able to deliver our Dress to Impress event. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, the Dress to Impress event is something where we receive several professional sets of clothing. This entire space that we're in right now was filled with racks and racks of professional clothing. Our students signed up, over 320 students came with over 100 volunteers to be able to help students pick out professional clothing for their future career, future interview processes. And so we were excited to still be able to host that. I'm also excited to announce that we have hired the new Director of Global Leaders. His name is Mr. Ryan Orkut. He'll be joining us on April 1st. He comes to us from Northeastern Oklahoma A&M. And within the report is additional information about him. We're excited to get him started to move that program along and get our new students selected. And finally, our Student Success Center was approved for Stage 3 Level 1 certification <coughs> for their tutoring program, and they received the maximum amount of certification time there with no reviews for five years. So very proud of that accomplishment out of that center. And that concludes my report. Okay, that's all good news. Uh, Governor Gibson? Dr. Ringer, on the um, Global Leaders Program, you say at least 50 will be selected for the program, and applications are due next month, or end of this month, actually. Um, so are you at liberty to say how many applications you have in hand right now? We have a low number of applications with a large number of qualified students. So as soon as Mr. Orchid arrives, he'll be hitting the pavement and recruiting those eligible students in our MOSO Merit Premier Level Scholarship uh, to invite them to participate or apply for the program. And he comes April 1. Yes. He, we may be extending our, our deadline if, if we don't have the, the pipeline filled for him upon arrival. Thank you. I had a question. Um, Governor O'Plotnick. Yes. Are the applicants for the global leaders, are they all freshmen or are they upperclassmen? They are all incoming freshmen. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And they have to be in that premier level of the MOSO Merit Scholarship that you've seen previously, I believe. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Dr. Winger? We'll look forward to hearing more about uh, that program and all the other good things going on. Um, the next report is uh, from our Vice President of Business Affairs, Mr. Eust. Thank you. I'll give you a brief, extremely brief um, construction update on where we are on the two projects that are ongoing on on this campus. The first is a residence hall project and the roof is complete on the whole facility and everybody knows that when you have a roof complete then they can start making hay inside and that's what exactly what they're doing. HVAC and water lines are complete on the whole facility and they, that building is kind of divided up into three sections. One section is uh, the walls are complete all the way up to the fourth floor and two of the sections are they're working on that and their sheetrock can be installed on, on those 
and the middle section has the storefronts installed on it. So we are very uh, pleased with the progress that's you know, continuing on that facility. We should be able to have a tour of the facility at our next board meeting, which will be in June, because the facility will be really close to being done, if not totally complete. So we, we're really excited to have you take a look at that facility. And the other project, you know, is the old trail from the, to the uh, with the city of Joplin. And we're waiting from the city on a conveyance of the property. Once they are able to convey the property to Missouri Southern, then we will be able to, put, and that's the piece that goes across Turkey Creek onto the other side um, from our property currently. We're, we're going to install some fitness equipment in there that was paid for by the Wellness Committee when the uh, further along in the spring when the ground is not as soft that we're not going to leave big ruts in the in the ground next to the trail. So we'll finish that project up here within the next few months. And piggyback off what Dr. Weiner said about HERF 2, the other piece of that, as we mentioned in the budget meeting, is the institutional portion of the HERF 2 funds which is about $6 million, and we're still waiting to hear from the Department of Education on guidance on how we can draw those funds down because piggybacking off TURF 2, you got HERF 3, 3 waiting in the wing for a larger amount, so whatever we can do in HERF 2, we can probably do with HERF 3, and every time they add another bucket of money, they expand the, the <laughs> use of those funds, which are very hopeful on how we can draw those down. That contributes to the budget preparation process, which you heard a little bit about this morning uh, from Mr. Gibson, and that's ongoing. It's a, it's a busy time around the uh, finance folks. Always is. <laughs> always is. Always is. <laughs> it always has been, but yeah. again, we appreciate all you and your team has done Thank it you. last year. With the... Anybody have any questions? Any questions from Mr. East? Okay, next we will hear again, I'll join with Dr. Van Galen in welcoming our Interim Athletic Director, Ms. Reed. She's familiar to us, but my first time here officially as part of the President's Council. Welcome, and uh, we're ready for your report. Thank you very much. Um, I'll highlight a few of the key items um, in the report in front of you. The first thing, at the conclusion of our winter sports season, uh, Missouri Southern is currently in first place of the MIAA's Commissioner's Cup. Um, that is determined based on a point system and how our teams finish in conference play. Uh, last year we finished in fifth overall. So after a strong winter season with our men's and women's basketball teams, as well as our indoor track season, um, we sit at, atop the standings right now. Um, following up on winter sports, we just concluded those seasons. Um, last weekend, we sent 13 student athletes to the NCAA Division II Indoor National Track Championships. Um, we had several earn All-American honors while they were there. The men finished 10th overall, and the women finished in 9th place overall. So we had very solid showings at nationals this year. A couple of follow-ups on men's and women's basketball as well. Cam Martin was a unanimous first-team All-MIAA pick, and Stan Scott also earned All-MIAA honors. And on the women's side, Carly Turnbull and Maddie Stokes were also named All-MIAA. Um, last but not least, we are thrilled to be competing in all sports this spring. Um, our student-athletes have been waiting for quite a while, it seems like, and so we are excited to be getting out there and competing. Currently, baseball is up to um, number four in the national polls right now. They've had one of their strongest starts um, in recent history. Tomorrow, football will play their first competition since um, 2019 um, at Southern Nazarene, so we're very excited for that. Um, softball currently is fifth in MIAA as they get into conference play. And both of all our golf programs um, have started, and we actually, the men's team finished second yesterday um, at the Roger State Tournament, and one of our student athletes was the individual champion as well. Two things we will be hosting this spring. Um, we will be hosting the MIAA Baseball Tournament on May 20th through the 23rd here on campus, and we will also be hosting the 2021 MIAA men's golf championships um, that will take place at Shangri-La um, course April 19th and 20th 
Any questions? Are there any questions for Ms. Reed about her report? Governor Gibson? So 13 students uh, to the indoor national championships. Has, give me some historical, historical perspective on that. Is that, is that routine for us? Uh, last year... Like, to me, that seems like a lot. It is. It is. Last year, we would have sent 19. They made the trip down to Birmingham. I remember that. were there for one day, and then everything was shut oh. down and made their way back. So They ran all the way home, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, that, it, that um, is, a good, is a good number for us. So how many of those 19 were seniors? How many of this 13 got to at least a second chance, I guess is what I'm asking, a different way? Well... For last year, everyone was granted a waiver by the NCAA okay, for good. all of those spring sports. If they chose to come back, they could. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, I can't tell you how many of those nights. Yeah, it would be hard to come back after not drinking. Um, but we did have, we had a number of um, baseball, softball, and track athletes return okay, for, another, for another year this year. Okay. Are there any other questions for Ms. Reed? Okay, now we are ready then to hear from our treasurer, Mrs. Ice. Good afternoon. Those financial statements for February of 2021. And we'll take a look at the cash graph, and it reflects a cash balance of $18.6 million. And this is a decrease of about a million dollars from last year. And on the graph, you can also see the variance from the the prior year before that, and it was about $800,000. So considering where we're at, uh, that's, that's fairly good news. Not that a decrease is good news, but compared to the $800,000, we're at a million down. We'll move on to the statement of net position, and this month we have a new line item on the statement of net position, and it is a reserved cash line. And that particular line basically represents internally unrestricted designated funds. And so just a way for you to see a number on there for some items that we internally designate. It might be something along the line of athletic camps that we need to track separately for NCAA reporting, those types of things. And so those dollars are there and represented as a separate line item on the statement of net position. Also, I wanted to note on here that you can see on here the, uh, I apologize, I got, I got lost a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> when I look at the prior month, you can see that there's a difference of $4.5 million. And a lot of that has to do with timing of financial aid. And we tend to have this in the spring. One year, financial aid may disperse in January. This year, it dispersed in February. And so that variance is from the timing of financial aid. When we look at total assets, we have a total of $184 million. And I also wanted to let you know when we look at the liabilities, we have a $126 million. And in the month of March is our bond payment that is due. It's an interest only. And that was about a million dollars that we paid out in the month of March. So when we look at total net position, we have about $58 million. The next statement we look at is the comparative statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position. And we always look at the difference column. And I wanted to note on here, we show a decrease between the two years of about $5 million. Within the tuition line, again, this has to do with timing of registration about how summer, when the timing of that registration happens. And for last year, we had significant summer dollars that were in last year's numbers. A little over a million dollars of that is timing from summer. So I wanted to point that out on that particular line. Also, I wanted to note on the state and local grants contracts, it shows a decrease of $126,000. But within that, there is an offset. We have an LCA autism grant that we received a little over $350,000 on as they continue to work on that particular grant, the construction and opening up that program. 
The next thing we look at is total operating expenses, and it also shows a decrease of close to $5 million, and that's from many different categories. We have a decrease in compensation, supplies, um, scholarships. So we offset some of the decrease in the revenue with an offset of some decreases in our expenses. When we look at the non-operating revenue line, you can see on there the appropriations dollars on there. There is a decrease, and as we talked about in the budget meeting, the governor has released the withholdings that were in effect at the beginning of this fiscal year in July. He has released those, so as we move towards the end of the year, all things being equal, and if there are no withholdings, we should be up a little over a million dollars compared to the dollars we received last year for our base appropriations. There's also another new line on there, and that's the federal stabilization money that we draw down. And right now you can see that we've gone down about 720000 That is restricted dollars for repair and maintenance here on campus. Um, but it is additional dollars to get some much-needed projects taken care of. So then when we look at income before the revenues, the current year is showing a gain of $8.7 million. <coughs> the prior year showed a gain of 7.3. So the increase between the two years is $1.4 million. Other things that are going on, we've talked about BKD is still working to finalize the FY20 audit by reviewing the CARES and the HERF funding. And that's moving along. And we are very hopeful that we will have that piece of the audit completed before June 30th and uh, just in time to move on to the next audit. I'll entertain any questions. Questions for Ms. Ice? And then I guess maybe if it's prepared in June, maybe a BKD might be back for our June uh, meeting. I, I think on that particular piece of it, it's it's a smaller piece of the audit as since they've done the presentation for okay. the finance portion of the audit. What we would propose is that they provide us the information and just give us some highlights from that if there's anything in there that we would we can okay. present to you at that time Maybe if budget. that works for the board. Yeah. I'm sure Carlos will be in touch and <laughs> let you know what we need. Are there any questions from Ms. I? Uh, before I forget, as I always do, Ms. Ice's uh, report does need approval, so I would entertain a motion to approve uh, the financials as Ms. Ice has presented them. So moved. Uh, I have a motion by Governor Haley. Is there a second? Second. A second by Governor O'Quatna. All those in favor of approving the financials as presented? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion passes. Okay, now we move on to our faculty senate president, uh, Dr. Gunderman. Thank you, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just wanted to say to begin with, this is my last meeting as faculty senate president. Dr. David Locker will be replacing me. Oh, that meeting. went fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's a blink of an eye. Um, but I want to thank you all for all of your hard work. We've talked about how we're not in as bad a shape as we thought we might be, and I think a large part of that is the, the, the diligent effort that this board has shown. And I mean, even working last week in that small group in Carthage, I think was a fantastic opportunity. Um, as for faculty senate, in the last couple months since our previous meeting, we've continued to work on projects focused on faculty welfare and the betterment of the university. So doc, working with Dr. Van Galen on expanding the idea survey for administrators, uh, reviewing the faculty grievance process, uh, completing the intellectual property policy, which now sits with Hush Blackwell for review, uh, as well as uh, reviewing master instructor language uh, once it's returned to us. So we, we just keep marching right along. And on a final note, on behalf of the faculty, I'd like to th uh, thank Dr. Carson for her years of service as VPAA and welcome her back to the classroom. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And that's all I have to report. Okay, are there any questions for Dr. Gunderman? I'm sorry it's your last meeting. I'll look forward to uh, meeting 
uh, the new president, but I too want to thank you. It was my first year of president, and I learned a lot uh, about the faculty perspective by listening to you, and I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it. Thank presenter. you so much. It's been a pleasure working with all of you. Okay, and we'll still see you around, I'm sure. Yes, you will. <laughs> thank you. Um, next is our uh, staff senate president, Mrs. Skull Smith. And don't tell us this is your last meeting, too. Um, this year has gone so slow in so many ways, <laughs> but it seems fast as far as seeing the faces of you two. It, it is my last <laughs> one, so, but... Um, and I we'll probably still later. can't pronounce your name right, and I'm so That's sorry. That's all right. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it now. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing on the agenda um, for our report um, is a Staff Senate update. So one of the things that Staff Senate has um, pursued this year is just increased communication across campus. So we, earlier this week, we sent out an update to staff, um, professional and classified staff as well, and the report is, is in your packet. Um, that was sent out, and it just gives us a, an update of the information um, of shared governance activities, of special events, campus projects, and then we also included some information about staff conversation overviews, featuring updates on the top three staff identified priorities for Staff Senate, and those came from a survey that we conducted in the fall of 2019. And but those priorities were to advocate for staff compensation, to increase staff morale, and to improve student retention and attainment numbers. So again, that copy of that report is, is in your packets. Um, but we're not finished yet, so even though we gave an update to campus with all the activities there, or most of the activities we've done, we still have more things on the, the agenda. So coming up in April, um, our um, community service committee is working on a, a working with the wellness committee here at Missouri Southern to do a planter contest. We're going to start that in April. Um, the winners will be announced um, on Earth Day, and we're going to help push some of the activities that and the trash cleanup and things that um, Dr. Carson had mentioned with the, the biology department. So the teams are going to be provided planters to decorate and plant, um, to paint, and then they'll fill it with flowers, and then those will be judged by students, and then they'll be put out around the residence hall area just as a beautification project for the spring. And then the last item is the elections. So we are gearing up to replace some of our members on the staff senate. There's three of us that roll off and six of us that are um, just temporarily put in. Um, they're filling vacancies that have occurred over the, over the course of the, the year. So we'll start nominations in April. They'll have the election the first part of May. And then the um, student or the staff body will, um, the 2021-22 staff senate will take over at the the meeting following the June meeting for our staff senate. Um, so, so you'll be with us next month. So I, I will next not meeting. be here. Actually, okay. our incoming president is Mike Upford. Okay. He's over around the corner. He's been at yeah. every board of We've seen him so. a lot of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we're leaving him in great hands. But um, to kind of mimic what Dr. Gunnerman has said, it's, it's been really a privilege to be up here and representing staff. And there's 350 roughly staff members on campus, so I'm very honored to be able to represent them. And we have 16 members of Staff Senate that represent that body as well. Um, but to be able to work with the board and to communicate with you and to communicate information back has just been a privilege. And so I thank you for letting us be part of this. And um, yeah, great job. <laughs> Good luck moving forward. <laughs> thank I'm you. To be thank you. All I did was my last one. one. I'm uh, sorry. Are there any questions for Mrs. Skullsmith? None. Thank you again for your service, and uh, again, we hope to see you around, too. Now it is time uh, for the committee reports. No, I almost forgot Ms. Ward, the Student Senate President. Uh, where's she at? Oh, there she is. Okay. Uh, uh, the Student worry. Senate report. This is not my last meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, too much change too fast. I don't know. Uh, so just a couple of updates. So the COVID ad hoc committee wanted to push for an altered spring break. Given um, the responses from both staff and faculty senate, we have decided to no longer push that. Um, we are also, so within our different... Committees. So we have our campus development committee, which has been working with Dr. Hodson and working on seeing what products we can do to better Missouri Southern as a campus and what would be beneficial to the students in the campus as a whole. Um, our campus relations committee has actually been working with a club on campus in order to try to better the mental health of students on campus. And they're planning a whole week um, during our dead week, the week before finals, in order.
order to sort of uplift spirits and try to get students through that um, through finals week. I believe that's all I have. So. Well, those Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, it sounds like uh, mental health around finals is always important, but particularly after a hard year. Uh, so we appreciate those efforts on behalf of the students taking care of each other and uh, working as part of the community with the uh, faculty and staff on the other issues. Are there any questions from Ms. Ward? Okay, let's move them quick today. Um, now we're ready for the board committees. And the only committee that met, I believe, was the budget and audit. Um, so we'll hear from Governor Haley. Thank you. Um, we did meet budget and audit committee and uh, most of the things we discussed. You've heard a little bit about, so we're <coughs> Working to hopefully get BKD to finalize the final annual audit. And also, as we're keeping track of this current year's budget, we're also starting to plan for next year's budget. So that's kind of an ongoing process. Uh, and then from there, we're looking at other things that we could do to try and make sure we're fiscally responsible and hopefully cash stays steady. But overall, I think that we had a good uh, budget and audit committee this morning. And most importantly, just making sure that we can stick to the budget and make sure it's fiscally sound and responsible. Are there any questions of Governor Haley? <clears throat> Is the Budget Committee uh, requesting any action at this time? Uh, no action today. Okay. I think then that's the end of um, our reports. Uh, Is there any old business we need to take up? I don't know of any, and I'm hearing none, so we will uh, move to new business. And uh, hear from Dr. Carson. For academic policies. Uh, yeah. I, it's my understanding the committee didn't meet, but perhaps the whole board could hear from you now. And then, yeah, we'll, sure. then we'll talk about it. Sure. Yeah. Historically, we have um, always have academic policies, haven't always met for that. I understand that uh, there may be some desire to change that. So I will leave it up to you all. I present to you the credentials that have made it through all of the, the entire internal governance process. Um, they are certificates and a couple of um, bachelor's level credentials I'll talk about as well. The certificates are mostly in the area of performing arts and CIS. Uh, again, they are offered with the same purpose as they always have, that is to allow our students to pursue some micro-credentials, to have very focused elective selections in the areas to help them um, gain additional credentials, multiple credentials when they graduate. None of our certificates, not, nothing in the um, academic policies proposal, including the degrees, includes any new courses, any new faculty, any new investment. So these are just unique packaging of um, what we are currently offering to try and offer students greater um, greater opportunity to demonstrate their, their learning and accomplishments here. So there are the certificates there. There's one graduate certificate that is proposed to exist and be carved out of existing MSM. The new programs are really just converting Bachelor of Arts degrees to Bachelor of Fine Arts. Again, no new course curriculum um, in there. There are, uh, there are essentially some more performing arts requirements in music and theater, but the primary advantage is that um, a couple years ago we were able to establish our institution as one which was um, allowed to offer BFAs, and that is really the advantageous competitive performing arts degree and the one that students are most interested in. And so we are just over time looking to either um, transform RBAs into BFAs or really just to offer BFAs that have highly comparable curriculum because that is the true professional credential valued in the field. So those are, uh, those are the ones that we have been working on lately. Again, nothing new um, in terms of significant deviation from what we do. So. Um, I thank you for your consideration of whichever ones you feel comfortable supporting. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Carson or I have some comments uh, before we present it fully to the board? 
Does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Carson right now, or do you want me to jump in? Um, uh, can I go one real quick? Yeah, please, Governor Haley. Of the number of certificates that we added, I'm assuming are these additional student expense, or are these budget neutral? How will these? No, they're budget neutral. So the certificates, um, so our theater department, I mean, in all my times here, we've talked often about the theater department because it's always been subject to low complete or whatever. Well, now we have worked very hard on it. We have like 40 majors in theater. So it's really, really awesome and transformed. And we have much greater collaboration between theater and music that um, enables us to even offer any sort of credential in musical theater. But what these certificates are really for um, are for students in those majors to be able to specialize in a specific area. But more than that, they're a way for non-theater majors, non-music majors to continue what's often a passion for them to use electives that already exist in their um, curriculum to allow them to have a credential in doing that. And that makes our classes bigger as well. So if the students can, most of our students now are wanting to pursue <coughs> something strategically that will result in a new credential. And we want to make sure if theater is something that they love and want to do as um, something for their entire lives that they can earn a credential in that as well. So it helps our class size to be larger in those areas. But there's no additional investment or cost. In fact, if you spread the fixed cost, it reduces costs. Okay, thank you. Is that just as to the certificates, or can the same be said of the uh, major and uh, graduate uh, programs being offered? Budget neutral. Yeah, the, um, the MSM, the graduate level certificate, just carves out an area of specialization. On the BFAs, we will likely, there are um, students who want to have careers in performance that will likely come here because it's a BFA and that's a preferred degree as opposed to a BA. But we will probably also see a lot of our BA students convert to um, BFAs just because of the respect of that degree in the field. Um, it's something we've always wanted to do. We just had to make a few investments in, in um, performing arts area to be able to be allowed to offer a BFA. So it's just Anything, and now that we've worked hard to be able to offer BFAs, um, we're excited to offer them. Okay, I'll go ahead with my thoughts. Um, it is on the agenda, and it's it, you know, it's presented to the board, and and I understand it's been uh, through all the committees, and I appreciate all those uh, committees' work. Um, but I'm not comfortable today probably going forward with, I'm still learning and I learned a lot last Friday about programming and how it works here. And I think the board has expressed a desire um, to have input on that. I think these programs may be great programs that I would be more comfortable, particularly with the major and the graduate certificates if those came up through academic affairs so that committee would have an opportunity to ask more in-depth questions was with a little more notice and information. Um, so I would propose, um, it's up to the board of course, that we did learn some about certificates and how they operate and with Dr. Carson's uh, assurance that they're budget neutral and uh, that perhaps we advance the certificates and hold off today then on the major and graduate programs till the academic affairs has a chance to make a recommendation to the board. What do you think, Governor Blotnick? Yes, I agree. Would you like a motion to that effect? Yes. Consider it, consider it moved. Okay, we have a motion to approve uh, the under graduate certificates today and to, to pass on the major programs and the graduate programs uh, presented. I'll second that. And uh, first pending, pending review of the Academic Affairs Committee. Yes. Uh, and the Academic Affairs Committee will be glad to uh, look at the information and take what you had today and um, ask any questions. So we have a motion to approve the certificates by Governor Elliott or Governor Gibson, a second by Governor Elliot, um, are there any other motions or uh, those in favor of that one? Say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. aye. Opposed? 
Hearing none, so we will um, advance the graduate certificates and approve those today. Uh, are there any other items of new business? So those will not be offered in the fall. These will not be ready for uh, the fall if they're taken well, up in June. Um, we have a meeting in June. Uh, if a special meeting needs to be called, uh, you can work with the Academic Affairs Committee to um, get it on the agenda for, for next week or next month, which isn't next month. Uh, the next regular meeting is in June. Right, and then they won't they won't make it through the rest of the external process for the fall, so that's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's fine with us. I just saw it for the first time Monday, so wanted yeah. to make sure academic affairs needs to. I think, according to our bylaws, academic affairs committee needs to approve those major. I'd be comfortable uh, if academic affairs could review the uh, proposed programs and give authority to academic affairs from the board to uh, move them forward in order to in order to be able to offer them in the fall. I think the hang up here is that you know we're the full board is seeing them for the first time and they've not had the benefit of review by academic affairs. So I, 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 I'm probably not going to have a lot of questions for academic affairs, but I do want the committee to have the opportunity to review. And Dr. Carson, what's the deadline that you would need these approved by in order to go into the fall? Two months before August? Two months before uh, we can enroll in or advertise those programs. So, and we start enrollment now basically so the sooner the better how many students does that would that impact how many students, students how many potential students would that impact what? current students who would switch over or potential new students potential new students or both or both You know, our theater department is doing well, so whether or not we have this BFA, we would probably see students going into our existing BA. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess 12 to 15 new students um, that may be impacted, and probably 25 existing students that are not gonna leave. They're not gonna drop out. They will just wait until it's there. The ones who would have graduated, however, and would have preferred to graduate with the BFA will be probably most significantly impacted, and that'll be about 13. When you say the most significantly impacted, explain that for us. Well, they wouldn't be able to finish with the BFA. They would have to be able to finish with the BA, which is a less demanded degree in the performing arts area. And these are students graduating in May? Next year. Oh, next year. Yeah. So, I guess, what's M Dude's uh, role in this? And Dr. McGrain talked about that. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is the conversation that needs to be had right. by academic affairs. <laughs> right. So, what, uh, perhaps a special meeting can be called and we can even do it via Zoom. Yeah. Uh, and we'll try to meet, meet your deadlines, but, but do our due diligence also. I'll reach out to you, Dr. Carson. We'll set a date. Get it set up. So, uh, Chairwoman Hershway, do you need something from the board to give the Academic Affairs Committee the authority to approve these on behalf of the board? Um, that would work. Uh -huh. well, it would save another special Zoom yeah. meeting of the full board. So, uh, is that uh, a motion? It is. I have a motion uh, by Governor Gibson that Academic Affairs be given the authority to investigate and approve uh, these programs at their, or disapprove at their discretion after uh, investigation. Is there a second? And there's a second by Governor Morgan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so academic affairs then, Governor Oplotnik will be in touch and, and let us know when there's a meeting on that. Future meeting dates set as of now are uh, June 16th. Uh, that's our final annual meeting. Um, the rest of the meetings will be set soon. I was 
uh, unexpectedly ill at the first of this week, so didn't get that finalized with our secretary, um, Ms. Boyd, but we'll get that out and she will get you those dates of our other future meetings. Um, there is a need to go into a brief, hopefully very brief, uh, closed executive session today um, pertaining to RSM 0610021 uh, and 3 uh, having to do with uh, legal and personnel matters. Um, and I'll need a motion and then a roll call vote uh, to go into that closed session. Is there a motion uh, to go into closed session? So moved. Governor Oplotnik uh, has a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Governor Elliott. Um, would you mind taking the roll for us, uh, Ms. Of course. T. Mark Elliott? Yes. Bill Gibson? Yes. Carlos Haley? Yes. Allison Hershaway? Yes. Marianne Morgan? Yes. Anita Oplotnik? Yes. Ron Richard? And Dr. Rosenberg? Yes. Oh, uh, what room are we in? I'm sorry. 309. 109. Right across the hall. Okay. 109, right across the hall. 309. 309. 309. <laughs> 309.